Morning, everyone, and welcome to our Enterprise Ireland UK webinar, Influencer Marketing in Agriculture. My name is Kevin Fenley, and I'm the Market Advisor for Agriculture based here in our London office. Over the next hour, we will take a look at the topic of influencer marketing and how you can incorporate influencers into your marketing strategy to help grow your brand and drive sales. I'm delighted to be joined today by Amy Eccleston of Pastures Green Communications and Atta Dairy Daughter, and Mervyn Harvey, Head of Commercial at Herdwatch. Thanks to you both for jumping on today and looking forward to your presentations. In terms of an agenda, agenda excuse me, for today's session, we will hear first from Amy, who will run through her tips and guidance for searching for, engaging with, and contracting influencers in the market. Then we will listen to Marvin, who will run through how he and his team at Herdwatch work with influencers to help grow their farm management platform. But first, a few pieces from our Enterprise Ireland site as ever. Um, a brief intro into our work, as many of you will know, we are the Irish Development Agency for Trade and Innovation, supporting over 5,000 companies to grow and scale in global markets. This is done through our head office in Dublin and our 40 plus offices, international offices, excuse me, around the world. In the UK, we have offices here in London and in Manchester, where sector specialists support our Irish companies with marketing intelligence and knowledge and work with UK companies to help them source the next innovation coming out of Ireland. Before I hand you over to Amy, I pulled this slide together to give you an idea of the work already going on across the client base on this side and the breadth of the work that's considered influencer marketing. Based on our registrations, which you've kindly provided, roughly 17 or 18 percent of you on today's call have engaged with influencers and paid for social content previously. And I have a couple of examples of those on screen for you now. So you can see here, you can see Tom Pemberton working with um, Easy Fits and Malone here. Uh, Tom, of course, is one of the biggest influencers, if not the biggest, in this space with over 400,000 followers across YouTube. He's a BBC show currently ongoing as well. Uh, and what he's doing is speaking to a huge base of British and Irish farmers twice a week. Um, you can see the viewership numbers there. You can see Easy Fix over 200,000 views with him, Malone over 400,000 views. And if you will, that's a strong uh, a viewership and a really engaged viewership of, of any publication that you might deal with. And, and just to show the example of the scale on this side, but you can also see other ways um, clients across, across the Irish network are working with influencers. Again, to go back to Easy Fix, working with Hoof GP, that's an influencer they would have brought on, on a stand at shows previously uh, to help bring attendees and, and engage with their staff at certain events. So that's one way you can use it. And of course, Herd Watch here, who we'll hear from Mervyn later, um, working with Farmer Phil to help attract farmers onto their stand for the launch of a new feature, um, which uh, Mervyn will touch on later. Just before I hand you over to Amy, a small bit of housekeeping for my our side. A quick word on the platform we're on, which is Zoom, of course. Your mics and video will be muted at this point. If you have any questions or, or comments, please pop them in the questions tab, as you will see there on the bottom of your screen. Thank, we would like to thank the many of you who have sent in questions in advance and any questions we cannot get to today. We'll be sure to follow up on email. And that is it from my side. And without any further ado, I will now hand you over to Amy Eccleston of Pastures Green Communications and after Dairy Daughter. Over to you, Amy. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you for everybody that's joining. Um, so yeah, as Kevin said, I'm Amy Eggleston. I run a business called Pastures Green Communications, helping people with rural and agricultural marketing. But also I have a um, my own um, Instagram page, which I have used to promote the dairy industry and other brands as well, um, which is at The Dairy Daughter. So um, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about working with influencers, using ambassadors to your advantage, and hopefully answer some of your questions. Um, as Kevin said, there's a question box, so feel free to ask them, um, ask them as we go, and if not, I'll get to them at the end. Um, I guess the first place to start really is a bit of definitions about influencer marketing and what it is, why you use it, um, because that's quite a popular question that people often ask. So first of all, I guess, what is an influencer? Who classes as an influencer? Um, so it's not always a celebrity. Obviously, traditionally, we thought that influencers were often celebrities, big names, people would see on television. And um, whereas now it's more actually people who have an audience online. Um, they might actually have an audience in quite a niche area, like in agriculture, um, but they will have specialised um, knowledge in that area. And that's why people trust them. Um, they won't necessarily have 50, 60,000 followers. They might be more micro influencers, which are clusters 10 to 30,000. But 
they still have an audience who resonate with them and at the end of the day trust what they say so what is influencer marketing then well essentially it's using these people to help promote your business or your product and um, the idea being that their audience trusts them and therefore trusts what they say so essentially if it was me i would be advocating for your product and um, on your behalf and i would be talking about the key things that make your product different, the key things that make your business different, and essentially selling your business for you or your product. Um, a lot of people ask and have asked in this in this um, webinar even about the return on investment, whether it's a good investment full stop, how they know that they've actually spent the money well. And um, I would just like to you know, put it out there and say, I feel it is a very good return on investment um, in terms of widespread marketing online. Um, I have worked in many different campaigns, whether that's me working with um, brands myself or pairing brands up with other influencers. And it does work. You know, there's proof that it works. Um, a lot of people are doing influencer marketing on uh, Instagram, about 67% of people actually on Instagram. And um, but there's also a big rise in obviously TikTok and um, YouTube, Facebook, it's happening everywhere. And um, I worked with a brand and shared a coat, for example, that I was wearing around the farm. I spent a couple of weeks trying out the product to make sure that A, I liked it and B, that I could genuinely, um, you know, talk about it and um 15 people bought it as soon as i posted it and um, the company soon messaged me to say that they would actually have to restock because um a lot of them had sold quite quickly so it's just proof it does work um, and i've seen it work time and time again and um, again just to reiterate you know you are putting something in front of an audience that you probably might not normally get in front of it might not be people that would go to a show normally and it's it's seeing the product on somebody they trust um and so that's what makes it genuine um obviously then we move on to a big a big question which is where to start how to do it and you know how influencer marketing even works um the first piece really is who, who who do we want what do we want and um i think it's important to think about what what we actually want to get from it so um you know do we have an idea of what kind of person we'd like to work with do we have like a specific location so for example if your product only ships to northern ireland or only ships to england then you would want to consider working with someone in that country because obviously a lot of their follower base will be in their own in their home domain if you like um, do you have an age range that you think um you'd like to get into um and is it you know is it somebody that is confident on video for example um not everybody talks to the camera some people film and kind of talk in the background so would you rather work with somebody who's happy talking to the camera? You need to have a bit of an idea about what this person does really, you know, obviously they might, you might say, okay, we want a dairy farmer, but go a bit further than that. Um, dig a little deeper, I guess, and kind of build a picture of who you're looking for. And um, the next would be obviously the exploration part, how you actually find these people. So this is what I do day to day. So I'm essentially like matchmaking brands with influencers. So um, the first place I'd always go to is, um, do you have any organic fans? So people who already tag you, share your posts, um, I'm sure lots of you have experienced this in the past, but before you even have a social media account, before you, um, you know, even think about working with ambassadors, there'll be people that will vouch for your brand for free, you know, organically. These people are a great place to start with influencer marketing because they have a genuine viewpoint. Yes, their audience might already be a bit saturated with your brand, but they're a good place to start because, you know, they genuinely can talk about you because they've used your product 
and it comes across really natural um, they're always an easy win you know go to them trial out a bit of an influence of relationship with them and see how it goes for some of you you might be thinking we don't have any of these people you know there aren't people out there who tag us or we've literally just set up our instagram or we don't even use facebook or social media you know how can we find people okay then this is when we have to start looking so um you know you might have a specific like i say a dairy farmer a shepherdess a shepherd you know you might have something really defining that means you want put someone in a specific industry so i'm just going to share my screen with you here okay so hopefully you can all see that this is my instagram page and my personal page and um, this is instagram and um, if you're not aware, if you haven't used it before, but the key thing here is this is my name. This is my essentially short biography about myself. Obviously here I have chance to give a bit more detail about myself, the fact I'm in Leicestershire, um, you know, the fact my age, but this is the key thing that I'm dairy farmer Amy. And the reason is because that is searchable. So when people type into the search bar dairy farmer, I will come up. So I always encourage people to make the most of that um, bio, you know, say what you do. If you are a machinery company, have it in there, because if people are searching for agricultural machinery, we want you to come up. So that's what's going to happen if you start typing in dairy farmer, pig farmer, sheep farmer, those people will come up first. So have a look at them. Don't maybe don't rule anybody out too quickly. Um, and I'd always say start to build a bit of a short list. Now I'll just stop sharing. So back onto me, but um, you'll get sick of seeing my face after this. But um, build a bit of a short list, and I guess start picking a couple of favourites. So you might start thinking, okay, we feel like we've got all the dairy farmers we can find from doing that search where else can we look where else do we turn to okay so what's the next step start looking at hashtags now you guys if you're on social media will have seen them you'll have used them hashtags are a great place to search for a wider audience so look at um hashtag lambing hashtag agriculture hashtag women in agriculture you know, these people will be using these hashtags and therefore they're a great place to start. Um, you might get some that are obvious no's. You have to be careful because location is a big one. You'll often get people that are in America and further afield and you might not want to work with somebody in America, let's be honest. Um, but think about how those hashtags um, are being used and I guess build a picture for this kind of person um, really just researching who, who you want to work with. Um, another great way to do this is through, I guess, friends of friends. So that might sound a bit strange, but this is by using other people's audiences. OK, so I'm going to share my screen again. So you might say, OK, well, our perfect person to work with is Hannah Jackson. OK, so for those of you that don't know, Hannah's a big and um, very popular de uh, sheep farmer in Cumbria, and she has a massive profile. She was on um, she was on TV and SAS Who Dare Wins, I believe, was the program. And she has a book. So she's got a big name. So you might say, OK, our perfect person is Hannah, but we think she's too big for us or, you know, she's too expensive. You, you don't think Hannah is um, achievable. OK, so who's Hannah following? You've got access now to everybody that she follows. OK, so some of these might be completely random, but have a look at the people she follows, you know, are any of these potentials? Okay, so this guy, he's got, okay, um, Joshua got George Gay, he's got 3000 followers, he's a sheep farmer, and he might be somebody that we could pair up with. You might find new people through looking at her audience, you know, and um, some of these people might not have a very good clear name, they might not use hashtags, so they might be quite difficult to find. 
put them on your short list. You know, you don't have to rule anyone out straight away. Just think about getting a bit of a list going. After you've done that, you need to obviously look for, a, look for any red flags and start ruling people out. At this point, I'd encourage you not to rule people out based purely on their following. I'll tell you why later, but try to look past how many followers they've got. Yes, obviously you need somebody with an audience, but try not to compare somebody with 15,000 and somebody with 30,000 followers like for like, and I'll come back to why. Um, first of all, red flags. You know, do, have they worked with one of your competitors recently? That's a bit of a no then. Do they post controversial pieces? Are they very opinionated? You know, do they talk online about you? You know, do a bit of due diligence, get searching, and I guess research them. You know, I'd always say follow along for a little bit. You don't need to approach them straight away. Um, I know you might be like really looking to get into this and you think influencer marketing is the way forward, but give it a bit of time, follow them for a week or two and watch their stories. First of all, it will give you a good idea as to whether there's any red flags. Do you not like the way they're swearing a lot or the way they're talking about other people? Um, or do you like the fact that they're happy to talk on camera and you think that would be a good style for your brand? Just essentially get familiar with this person because at the end of the day if you're going to be working with them you want to know a bit about them my next tool for due diligence is one which some of you may have seen before but i'm sure lots of you haven't so for example say you come across this um, particular influencer eleven thousand followers um, and you know you think he might be a good um, a good example of who to use now, um, you may, for example, be comparing him with somebody else. You may have him on your short list and you may think, OK, this one has 10.8 thousand followers. This other one has 15,000. How am I going to compare them? Now, the best way to do this is use um, a website called Social Blade, which I'm going to share now. So social, hopefully you can all see that. Please tell me if not. Um, social Blade is doing the due diligence for you. Now, this website you can use for lots of different channels, but obviously here I'm using it to look at this guy's Instagram page. Now I can do it for my own. You know, I can look at my own if I wanted to, but also I could look at people's YouTube channels. You know, like um, Kevin said, Tom Pemberton's a big one. If you wanted to look at his YouTube channel on here, all the data is available and you can you can dig quite deep. Now, the number I'm encouraging you to look out and look out for is this engagement rate. OK, so um, James Warwick, who is um, a mixed farmer, has, has an engagement rate of three point three percent. Now, this is much easier to compare than followers. This means 3.3 percent on average of people are engaging with James's posts. So that means either liking, commenting, sharing. These people, 3% of people are engaging with him. Now, 3% might not sound like that much, but in other industries, so beauty, food and drink, and outside of agriculture, the, um, the benchmark that people aim for is actually 2%. So, um, just, just think about that. Instead of comparing people's follower numbers, think about their engagement rate. And um, additionally, you can have a look here on how many followers they're gaining day to day. So as you can see here, James is gaining um, one follower this day, losing two another day. You can see that the growth on his page is quite natural. So I'll stop sharing, but you can go and have a look at that. The growth is clearly quite natural, gaining one, losing one. My red flag or things to look out for here would be what I call non-organic growth. So if people were buying followers online, then their growth would be exponential overnight. I've seen it happen. A, quite a popular agricultural influencer went from 10,000 followers to 25,000 followers in a week. It was quite clear something was going on. She was gaining 2,000, 3,000 followers a day, every single day. Now, that just doesn't happen in, in reality, unless you pay for followers. 
You might be thinking, why is this an issue? Well, the followers you pay for are not farmers. You know, they're not your audience. You're essentially paying for robots to follow you. So she might look like she has really good follower numbers, but actually her the followers that are engaging with her are quite few. So again, is her engagement rate rubbish? Because let's be honest, it would be because these people aren't going to be liking and commenting on her posts. So use Social Blade. It's a free website. You just have to make an account, but it is free. You can do like the basics for free um, and just, just do a bit of due diligence on these people. Um, and obviously the next thing would be to reach out to them. Now, um, I'm not going to, you know, pull anybody out or um, single any companies out, but there is quite a lot of companies doing this wrong, unfortunately, and that is why the, the ambassadors or influencers might not respond to their messages. Um, I get quite a lot of messages from brands and very often they aren't personalised. So the first thing I'd say is always make it personal. Like I want you to send a message that's clearly just been sent to me. Um, you know, Amy loved your post on um, your carving season. We'd love to talk to you about maybe working together. Thanks, Heather. You know, sign it off with your name. Um, it makes it personal. It makes it seem like there's actually a person behind the account. Um, I guess, I guess just don't blanket one message out to everybody. Um, they're not all going to want the same thing. They're not all going to be interested in the same product. So please just um, think about it and make it a bit personal. Equally, if you don't have an Instagram account or a Facebook account and you don't use social media that often, why not... Um, drop them any drop them a message but ask them to email you because then you know it's going to get picked up the message won't get ignored just ask them to send you an email give them your personal email address you know don't give them the company wide one make it personal and just say we'd love to talk to you um there is there is a lot of companies out there you know sending generic messages and i'm sure while it works a lot of the time um it could get ignored quite easily because it just seems generic and doesn't really seem like much effort went into it. Um, sorry, I feel like I'm talking quite quickly. I know there's like quite a lot of information, but we will go on to questions at the end, um, of course, and feel free to pop any in the chat box as we're going along. Um, the next little bit I'm going to talk about is the cost of influencers, contracts, you know, what to expect and how to measure the results of influencer campaigns. Now, this is obviously like a big, a big one. This is what everybody talks about when when they think about influencers, like how much is this going to cost me? Now, firstly, I must point out there's a huge difference between gifting someone product and asking them to do sponsored content. So like an influencer campaign. Um, gifting content means that you send something to somebody and you send them hoping they'll post, but you don't pay them any money. Sponsored content is where you essentially have a contract. You agree that you're going to send them this product or you're going to give them a trial of this and they agree that they will post X in return. So. Obviously, um, the key thing with this is if you send somebody as a gift, they have no contractual obligation to post. So you might come out of it feeling a little bit disappointed when you send out six or seven products and you don't get anything back from it. Now, I'm not saying this would happen because I know gifting works and it does work, you know, um, Food and drink influencers, you know, in, the, in that industry get sent food and drink products to try all the time and they will often post them so it can pay off. However, there is no guarantee of what they're going to say. There's no guarantee how many times they're going to post. You know, they might just have the little product in the corner of the photo. It won't be a main feature of the product, uh, of the picture, you know. Um, you don't have any guarantees essentially. So think about the difference between the two and think about how you'd like, like to approach it. I'm not saying there's a right or wrong, but 
um, with sponsored content, there is more of a guarantee of what you're going to get back. And um, if you would like to build a long term relationship with somebody, I always think that's a great, um, I guess, a great thing to aim for. And therefore, you know, you're going to get a feel for what products they like. You're going to get a feel for which areas of your business they um, they, they find useful and which areas or which products they maybe don't you know not everybody is going to want every single product or service you offer so we want to think about this as a long-term relationship of somebody we can work with in the future so um yeah i guess that's just the first thing to point out um that gifting is a popular a popular way to do this but um influencer marketing isn't always free so the next way to do it obviously would be sponsored content, which as I say, is where you would pay somebody. Now, um, you, you, most of you, lots of you will have marketing budgets to adhere to. And obviously I know you've got to get a return on that investment for the brand, for the company, and you can't just spend money willy nilly. But often influencer marketing is actually cheaper than um, traditional marketing, you know, magazine adverts, especially in the UK, um, can be very expensive. Um, I know how much it costs to put something in the Farmers Weekly, and um, you know, it's it's two thousand pounds we're looking at for putting an article in. So um, I'd just like to start off by saying, influence marketing is cheaper than that. Um, obviously. It's always going to depend who you use. Some people might charge more than others, but you know this isn't massive, massive figures we're talking about. So now, um, you know, what about cost? Now, if you send somebody a message on Instagram and you do as do as I say, you know, hello, Amy. Um, I'm just using myself as an example. We'd love to work with you or talk about collaborating in some way. Um, please could you email us and um, we'll chat further. This person might say, yeah, no worries, I'll drop you an email. And then they may drop you an email and it may have their rates on it. Now their rates are essentially their set fees. So, you know, they might be set from the start. You might not have any chance to negotiate. It might be, this is how much they charge for a post. Okay, so for somebody who's like, um, 8,000, 10,000 followers, this might be, okay, I'm going to charge 100 to 200 pounds per post. So that's for one post on the social media channel. Now, really, you want it to be on the social media channel that they use most often. If you don't use that channel, don't worry about it. You know, if you're, if they're using Instagram, but you don't have an Instagram account, don't worry about it, because they can still link to your website, they can still get the key points across and I'll come more onto that later as well. But yeah, 10, uh, eight to 10,000 followers, they might say, okay, it's a hundred pounds, 200 pounds a post. This might then go up to um, two to 300 pounds when they've got 15,000 followers and so on and so forth. Now, in agriculture, this whole ambassador influencer marketing is quite new. So the chance of them saying, here's my rates, and they have a set rate card, is probably quite slim. You know, they might not have done anything like this before, especially if you're choosing someone smaller. Obviously, if you're choosing to work with somebody like Tom Pemberton, Hannah Jackson, you know, the big ones, you'll probably get sent through to their agent because somebody will deal with this for them. But if you're dealing with them directly, they might not really know how much to charge. They might be unsure of how much it's going to be. In those cases, I'd say, okay, let's think about this more like a long-term relationship. You can always test it to start and see how it goes, but think about it being a three to six month campaign. So instead of saying, we'll pay you 200 pounds to do one post and then that's it, why not say, we'll pay you 400 pounds to do two posts and two lots of Instagram stories over a three, four month period. That way, not only do they get to work it into their content when it seems natural, so it seems like a good fit, but also it gives them time to genuinely use the product, get used to it, and I guess share it in an authentic way. Um, 
it doesn't need to be a one size fits all approach. You know, it doesn't need to be, okay, I'm going to pay them 100 pounds for this. And then I'm going to pay them another 100 pounds for this. Think about this being a long-term relationship. You know, could, could you maybe work with them in a different way um, such as asking them to come to a show with you, you know, um, maybe come to your HQ and make a video about how the product's made, things that are a little bit more like outside the box. Um, I just encourage you really to, to think about it in a, in a longer term manner. Um, and again, look at those engagement rates. Um, we're not focusing here too much on their following. We just really want to know that a, they like the product and B, their audience are going to engage with it. So obviously there's no right, right or wrong when you're searching for people. However, if you send me, for example, um, a very techy, high price item, which is very, very um, high technology, then it might not be for my farm, just personally because we are a grazing farm and um, outdoors nine months of the year trying to focus on low cost efficiency rather than technology. So, you know, you might want to work with somebody who's more focused on technology, looking at robots, that kind of thing. And um, think about the person and how they work for your product. Um, we'll come back on to um, types of content you work with them with in a minute but I just want to talk about the finances a little bit more um obviously like like I say it doesn't need to be um a one-off fee but I would always encourage you to have a contract in place so a contract obviously ensures both sides meets what they've promised they're going to do so you ensure that you're going to um provide the product um pay them with x amount of money you know, do whatever they need you to do. And they ensure they're going to do X amount of posts. They're going to um, use this hashtag, tag you, use your web link. A contract protects both sides. You know, um, I'm not saying you absolutely have to have one. And I've definitely no influence campaigns have worked without them before, but it's just, I think quite important now to think about um, and also, it gives you the option to say, can we include something like an approvals process, for example? So an approvals process would be um, you give them the content, um, the, the product, the service, and say, OK, you've got a month to create this content. We would like you to send us the content before it goes live. You can absolutely ask to see it before it goes live. You are paying this person. You know, you see an advert before it went in a magazine. So an approvals process means they have to send it to you before it goes live. That is absolutely a done thing. You know, there's no shame in asking for that. Um, could you, you know, put in a bit about there about them maybe doing one of the posts from your account? Again, write it in the contract. Who has the rights to the photo? Um, yeah, just just think about protecting both sides and how that's going to work. Um, in terms of, you know, content, like I say, one of the big things is off people often say, well, I have a high price item. My item costs or our brand sells items that cost thousands and thousands of pounds. We can't do gifting for a start. And we definitely can't just send an influencer a product for them to try and then, you know, to hope to get some posts back from it. You know, it, our price is too expensive. OK, think about this in another way then. What could you do for them that they will benefit from, that will share the brand? You know, could you invite them to your workshop to see how it's being made? Could you invite them along to a show and maybe get their ticket for them? You know, could you do a webinar with them talking about the product? I'm not saying you have to send them the product for free. You know, trials, trials are a great way of doing this, but involve them with, with I guess, like the company. You know, if you want them to be sharing company news and sharing company information on their social media channels, which let's be honest, they often have a big reach. It's reaching a lot of people. Involve them. It's, it's actually it's as simple as that um 
you know, it totally depends what you want to get out of it. But um, I just think there's lots of different ways to do it and we don't need it to be set one set way. Um, I'm going to share my screen again, if it lets me, um, just to show you some examples of shared content that, um, that I've seen recently that I think worked quite well. Um, apologies, let me just share my screen. So um, this is one example of a, um, hopefully you guys can see this PowerPoint. Um, hopefully this is one example of a um, sponsored, sponsored campaign. So this was with the Red Shepherdess, as I said, the, um, the Hannah Jackson. Now, obviously here she's put ad straight away. So that's something to be aware of. She has a legal obligation to put ad. She could be pulled up by the Advertising Standards Agency or the ASA if she doesn't do that. You know, so yes, that's on her. That is on her. But you should have that in the contract. She needs to put ad because people need to know she's being paid for this. You know, there's nothing worse than seeing a big celebrity, for example, promoting something for example, a gambling campaign, and you think, have they been paid for that? You know, they have to declare it because otherwise people don't know what's their own content and what's not. Again, here she's tagged the company. So she's working with AHDB Beef and Lamb. She's put some facts in and then she's used hashtags. So those things will have been contractually agreed. She has to tag, she has to use the hashtag we eat balanced and she has to put ad. The rest of it is kind of up to her. They've given her a bit of creative free reign. And, you know, that is something I would encourage, um, giving the influencer a little bit of creative free reign. Um, and it's the same in the one she did here. She tagged the company. She, um, you know, used a hashtag. And again, she's put ad in hashtags. So um, yeah, just, just a little example of some um, influencer sponsored campaigns. There's more if you want to see them, but I'll, I'll keep moving on. Um, the thing to point out here that I found quite interesting is that this, this brand, Well Beloved Cats, a pet, sorry, have given this influencer, Red Shepherdess, a discount code. So this Hannah 20 basically gives um, people a discount code on the product. Now, I know this isn't always possible for all of you. It, sometimes it's just, you can't do it. it it's not going to work. But it is a great way of tracking how well it's worked, if you can. You can see then how many people have used the um, discount. You can see what returns you're getting from it. And it's very measurable. You know, um, it can be a unique, a completely unique one to her. And only she can essentially only she is sharing that code um but it just means that you know she, you then know how many people have used it um another another thing to think about to measure if it's working is um you know maybe website views um if you don't have a social media page or for example you're working with somebody on instagram but you don't have instagram then you will ask them to include a website link and direct, direct people straight to that page. Now, you might then see um, how many people have viewed that page. The influencer will be able to see how many people have clicked through to the website. So you could ask them, you know, just out of interest, how many people viewed the website? Did you get um, an increase in product sales? Like I said, with the coat, when I was wearing... The, the the clear return on investment was that the product sold and um, would you like to encourage people to sign up to a newsletter how many newsletter signups did you get what engagement on the post you know how many likes did it get you can ask the influencer that because it's not always viewable anymore how many likes did you get on the post and that will give you an idea of how successful the campaign has been how well your money's been spent. It's actually measurable things that you can take away and say, okay, well, that worked, but could we try something else next time, for example? Um, 
I know I've rattled through a lot of information there and there is quite a lot to cover. I'm going to just summarise a few of the quick points and then I'll just hand over to Mervyn. But um, it's such an in-depth in -depth topic, but it definitely has potential. I just, you know, I really want to emphasise that. I've seen it working. I've seen it working for other people. I'm working with people at the minute who are, are doing influencer marketing for the first time. And, um, you know, the the results speak for themselves. I'd say if you haven't already, it's definitely something to consider. Don't be too daunted by, by it. And yeah, just, just to summarize, um, the influencers might not actually class themselves as influencers. You know, they might actually only have a small account with um, 10 to 15 or eight to 10,000 followers even, but they are an ambassador. People trust what they say. You know, I'm sure Mervyn can back me up on this one, but people are listening to what we're saying. You know, as lame as it is, I posted a jumper I was wearing. I didn't even tag the company and I get people messaging me asking where it's from. You know, I have an impact on the audience at the end of the day and I've built trust with them. That's why they follow along. Um, you definitely don't have to have the specific channel for it to work. You don't have to be on YouTube if you want to work with a YouTuber. Sure, some of you that have worked with Tom Pemberton can, can vouch for that for me. And um, just think about how you're going to measure how effective it was. Please, please, please remember to tailor the, the message out to people that you send. If you take one thing away from it, it's that blanket messaging people can be quite spam spammy you know it doesn't seem personal and um, I'd really encourage you to think about that um with machine with expensive machinery we've got to think outside the box it's not always gifted product but um you know ad campaigns sponsored content and working with influencers is still very much possible and can still be very successful so um, yeah, I think that's all I've got, but please feel free to ask questions if you would like at the end. Thanks, Minya, for that, Amy. I think that's great guidance for clients. And as you say, showcasing the, the value it can bring and the value it can bring as part of a wider marketing strategy. And I think no, no better follow-up to that than an example of a client doing that already. And that's Mervyn Harvey of Herdwatch. And I'll hand over to you, Mervyn, to run through a bit about how you're engaging influencers and how you've worked with them in the past. So without any further ado, over to you, Mervyn. Many thanks, Kevin, and many thanks, Amy, for that insightful uh, chat. Just give me a second, and I will share my screen here. Okay, so everybody should be able to see that. So we're just going to bring through a few slides just on some of the activities and how Birdwatch goes about uh, creating our social media strategy uh, that includes influencers. So just for anybody who's in the audience today and is not familiar with what Heard what you do. Um, we're Farmer Focus Software as a Service Platform based here in Ross Gray, County Tipperary. Um, we've been running, we've launched back in February 2014 and uh, we have been supported by Enterprise Ireland all the way. I must say thank you to their support as well. But what we do is a very simple, easy to use app um, that helps farmers to reduce their farm paperwork. And ultimately, the more information they put into it, the more information we give them back out of it helping them make better decisions to meet both uh, environmental challenges, financial challenges, and uh, address farm assurance paperwork uh, at its core. In essence, we digitize and automate livestock farming, and our platform is now number one across Ireland and the UK. Um, we have Herdwatch as our core product, and as of yesterday, we have officially launched uh, Flockwatch, uh, which is designed to help sheep farmers uh, track their sheep, their flock performance. Just a few facts and figures because I'm quite fond of stats. Um, we've over 16,000 active farms in Ireland and the UK. Uh, we have over 2 million animals uh, live on the platform at any time. And we, over the eight years, we've had, had over 2 million calves registered just through the Herdwatch app. And as of this year, um, Herdwatch has uh, been responsible for registering over 26% of all calves born in Ireland here to date. When we look at our 16,000 users, we're actually holding over 30 million farm records and pieces of data to the, for them, um, whether that's an animal, whether that's a medicine record, whether it was a calf registration, 
or even a, a hoof care record. To get on to social influencer marketing, I think the best place to start is you need to understand where your customers are on social media, what they're consuming, how they're consuming it. Uh, Herdwatch, we do an annual survey, significant large survey, and one area is just about media consumption. Now it covers print, it covers online media, but it also covers social media. And it's a very simple question to ask your members in your annual survey if you do one, or to do a, a one-off survey to at least get a snapshot before you get into this. Where do your customers live when they're online? Because if your existing customers exist on Snapchat, well, you're going to find more like them on Snapchat. So, and within that, over the years, you can track the trends. So here you can see the blue bars last year's survey, the green bars this year's survey, which is now over 1,700 respondents to this survey. So it's a significant sample size as well. Well, you can see year on year, Facebook is coming back a little bit from 63 to 61%. And within that Facebook, you've got to ask yourself, what's the demographic as well? Well, a lot of us here will be targeting the farming community. Um, and we know the average age of farmers is up there. Um, and a lot of them are still very active on Facebook, whereas a lot of the younger people have migrated to new platforms. One thing we saw two years ago when COVID began, the two years ago, YouTube consumption was only just about 40% and COVID drew off that up by 50% over 61%. It settled back a little bit to 57% in the last year, but it's still very, very strong. And I'm gonna come back to YouTube in a minute because it does something different to all other social medias. Uh, Snapchat, 32%, so one in three. Instagram, flat year on year. Uh, one in three. Twitter, still one in four. Um, but, you know, what are people using Twitter for? Is it just to, to hear that, you know, to get opinions out there or are they getting stuff out, out there to share? The big growth in the last few years has been TikTok. And now this is a sample of 1,700 farmers, but there's 18% uh, of those 1,700 farmers are telling us they're on TikTok. I won't say they're necessarily sharing videos on TikTok, but they're certainly... Uh, following other people and influencers on TikTok. And then ultimately the last one is 4% don't use any. So that's just a snapshot. And I think that would apply to most agribusinesses um, in Ireland and the UK, perhaps even further afield. But get that view on where your customers live on social media. That way you can start targeting them. From that, we need to find out where the influencers are. Okay. And there's a number of places that they're going to exist. Uh, YouTube, I said I'd come back to it. YouTube is an amazing space for you to work with influencers to get your message across. The reason for that is, is a lot of social media these days is very quick. Um, whether that's TikTok, Snapchat, Twitter, um, it's People are just consuming so much media and it can be quite fleeting their engagement with it. Uh, I've certainly noticed it myself and that, you know, in the, in the evening there, I'll flick through uh, the people that I follow on Instagram and then into Snapchat, the same thing. But, you know, you just need to be careful that some of it, if there's too much, it can become white noise. The beauty of YouTube is YouTube is actually not so much a social media as in it's replaced the TV screen in a lot of farm households. And I can tell you a number of stories of Irish farmers where home and away is no longer the go-to um, at lunchtime when they come in for the dinner. And instead the tablet is propped up on the table and they know that Farmer Phil has a new video on Mondays, Tuesdays and Sundays. And it becomes part of their viewing week. And that's where the power of it comes into, that they sit down to watch YouTube. It's not necessarily this engagement of I'm scanning or skimming through the content. So YouTube, big fan of here. You then have Instagram and Snapchat and TikTok, which would be very much the consumer and the younger audiences. But still, we've seen on the previous slide, you're varying anywhere between 18% to TikTok to 30 and 32%. 
uh, engagement rate on uh, Instagram and Snapchat, respectively. And then there's the other ones. There's an awful lot of influencers, particularly farming influencers on Twitter. Okay, and there's a few of them on LinkedIn as well. And they're very much the industry type people. So it depends. Are you trying to influence and communicate with farmers? Or are you actually trying to influence and communicate across the farming industry? Um, and that Twitter and LinkedIn still have a place within that. Okay. So that's right, nowhere to find it. Once you know where to find it, know where your customers are, you know where to find the influencers, it's on to building your herd. Okay. And there's a number of things here, and I'll come back to them in the recommendations. But Amy mentioned it earlier on as well. The number one thing you should be doing is find the people who are already following you. If you have any social media presence, okay, the people who are social media influencers are very active on social media. They're following an awful lot of people. They could be engaging with your product already and your brand. They could love your product. And certainly over the years, that's where we found the majority uh, of our influencers, the people that had heard watch and were paying for heard watch for years before their social media profile came. Once you start finding them, understand that this isn't necessarily just a paid thing, okay? That there's the opportunity there for you to use your brand to help them grow their profile. And as such, all tides will rise together. And I'll give a few examples now in a minute or two on that. Okay. You want to be promoting them as much as you can. Okay. Not just here, can you tell your followers about this? It needs to be a part. Yeah? And you need to work together. And within that, what's important is that you put significant, the right amount of resources behind this. Okay. And the right, give it the right amount of time because it is a very efficient marketing channel. And that's what you need to work at at first. This isn't something that's, you know, brand new. This isn't something that's going to replace something else. TV never replaced the radio. Okay. The online never replaced uh, the TV. This is just another channel. And people have a massive ability to consume large amounts of media. What you've got to try and do is just help all these people build their own little platform, and then you will grow together. Within that, it's so important. And like, we're in a, we're in a hard business and hard watch here as a software, as a service. And it's very hard, you know, to market software as a service from time to time um, because it's not material, okay? So it can be hard to engage with. So you've got to bring them on board with what you do. You've got to keep them informed on what your business is doing. They've, you've got to make sure that they're getting the best of support uh, from your team, that they're actually genuinely engaging with your product and your brand, and they understand themselves, even without you telling them, what the benefits are of your services. Okay? Because what happens then is the beauty of it is, even when the unpaid ones, if they're tagging calves there, like in February and January, any of the dairy farms here in Ireland at the moment, you're getting tagged every day on how you save them a couple of minutes out of a very, very busy day at the busiest time of the year, just in something so simple as calf registrations. So I'm just going to cover off just a number of recommendations. It is part of your marketing mix. So think of it as another channel and make sure it's got the resources it needs to do well and succeed. Find the influencers who already have an interest in your brand or use your product. A good influencer will help not just increase your brand awareness, but they'll also share your value proposition and help drive conversion. And what I mean by that is they won't just wear a hoodie on it. They'll actually show people the value they get out of your product. And from time to time, if you've got a little sale around the plowing or the Black Friday, that'll that help to share it too. Know how to identify an, if an influencer has genuinely engaged followers. Amy showed you a great tool there earlier on. Um, one way I would recommend people is say, if you go onto YouTube 
and somebody's got 50,000 followers. Just check of the videos in the last two weeks, how many views have they got as a percentage of the followers? And the same way you can do it on Instagram. If they've got 100,000 followers, right? If they're only getting 10 likes <laughs> per post that they're going up, obviously low engage. So, you, you know, there's tools, but you'll be able to eyeball it as well. But really important, uh, you know, don't engage with the spoofers. It does not have to be paid, as I've mentioned already. If you help them grow their platform, all tides will rise together. And you can see here on the right hand side, our early engagements with Louise Crowley and Farmer Phil, we actually did case study videos with them. We paid for, for it to be created, shared on the paid media platforms in Ireland, and obviously promoted through our own channels, which are significant. We've got over 5,000 Instagram followers, 25,000 Facebook, 10,000 Twitter. So, you know, use your own platform to drive the growth. Keep them up to speed at what's going on in your business. I and mean, that can be a two-way street And that we run webinars every month to inform our members of new services and new, new features available from Herdwatch. And last year when we launched Farm Maps, we had Farmer Phil on, and then we did a milk module um, for milk records for our dairy farmers. And Hazel Mullins came on to also cover some advice on selective dry cow therapy. So, you know, it is very much helping each other grow. Do not try and control every bit of it. Allow them to be creative. So, you know, ultimately they've got to find the value for themselves and it has to come across in a natural uh, and unforced way. However, if paid, do have the contract of set minimum expectations and request approvals if it's significant. It does require attention. And unfortunately, the law of marketing is always going to apply no matter what channel, that there will be a law of diminishing returns if you're pushing the same message into the same channel over a period of time, okay? So you've got to be dynamic, you've got to be creative, and you've got to be constantly thinking about what's the next platform and who's going to be the next person coming up behind Farmer Phil or the Dairy Dog. Uh, I think I mentioned it already to use the content and influencers across all channels, like with the, the webinars we have here, but also all social media channels. And then finally, and apologies, I know I'm going very fast here, read the comments, right? especially when your product is featured in an influencer video or post that read what customers are feeding back, because some of it might be coming across incorrectly. So you need to, you need to uh, sharpen the blade. Um, in other cases, you'll just get gems of feedback that you just, as a business, are so satisfying to know that you're doing a good job. And not only is it great to see that online, it's great to be able to take it sometimes and share it internally within the business because an awful lot of work tends to go into these things behind the scenes. And it's nice when we get the credit from time to time. Uh, that is my slides for today. I think we're going to have some questions and answers now. Thank you for your time. Absolutely. Thanks for that, Mervyn. Some great tips for companies and great to see the work you're doing and how you manage from that side. I just ask you if you could unshare your screen. Yeah. That'd be brilliant. And I'm conscious, uh, everyone, thanks uh, for, for jumping on the line. Um, we're coming up against the clock. So we'll just stay on for another five minutes. If you have the time to run through a couple of questions that you've sent in earlier. And the first, I see Amy is back on screen here. Uh, I might pose to you. I'm conscious there's a number of companies in the in the chat here and attending um, uh, today that are early stage that they might be setting up their Instagram page or their Facebook page, and this is a whole new world and the UK sector might be new to them. What tips would you have for we say an early stage company entering the market and how they can manage this? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I'd say spend a bit of time like following influencers, like following farming people full stop. You know, they don't have to necessarily be the perfect person that you would work with, but they don't know your accounts there for a start until you follow them. Um, so it's a good way to generate followers, but also um, it will just work as kind of like a two way thing. So you can spend a bit of time scrolling and um, if you've, you know, if you've got five minutes in the day, you can just spend a bit of time scrolling and just get a bit of an idea of what other companies are doing, of what these influencers are doing. And it will just 
it's, it's a bit like market research, isn't it? You know, you need to follow these people to know what they're doing. Like I said, you really want to follow them for like a short while before you get stuck in and try and actually approach them. But um, yeah, just follow them because they might not know you've got an account. And then like Mervyn said, they might just start tagging you, you know, without you even having to do anything. They might just already use your products. And it's a great way to find organic fans that, that genuinely do use the product and might have done for like 20 years. Okay, absolutely, absolutely. And and just sorry, questions after coming in from Irvin. Um, I'm not sure if you're able to answer this, but for Herdwatch, uh, do you the survey results that you've gathered show different age demographics? Um, uh, your they, they, they absolutely do. I suppose that, that has everybody in there, but we break that down not just by age, we break it down by location, by farm type, whether you're dairy, suckler, beef, sheep. Um, and we really drill into it and we get, you know, obviously, look, I don't want to give away all the secrets here, Kevin, but, you know, we can see clear differences, um, certainly in the UK, between beef, sheep and dairy farmers. And, you know, we'll, we'll use that um, to our advantage to help us communicate our message. Okay, great. And I'll keep picking on you, Marvin, if you don't mind. Um, a, a lot of people sent in when they were registering around questions around KPIs and how to measure success. And I know that's something a lot of our companies are conscious of. And what does success look like for Herd Watch with Farmer Phil or whatever brand ambassador you engage with? How do you measure that from, from your side? Good, good. Look, ultimately your business KPIs, your business KPIs. And you know, we're driven by subscriber growth and revenue. And it doesn't matter what marketing channel that comes off. You need to come up with a way of measuring it. Um, for us, we have the ability to do it in that. Because we're a fully digital journey, we're able to track people from a specific link that they click on through to download, through to account creation, through to whether they turn pro. I think what you see with Amy's example earlier on, example earlier on where it's a transactional thing, whether it's uh, clothing, you know, you can do a discount code. But you do need to measure it. But you're social media and your social influence or business kpis are no different from the kpis you already have as a business no no sorry and on that amy we'd say the kpi piece how would you include that in contracts and is there a way for with a herd watch engagement with a brand ambassador or whatever company it might be to ask an influencer to give over their engagement numbers how could you manage that in your view from a company's perspective yeah, I mean, normally, obviously, like you, like I say, you want to try and build a relationship with these people, so it's not just like a one-off thing. Um, and I normally kind of bring it up before before you've even started working with them. Like, you know, if we were to pay you, because like Mervyn said, it doesn't have to be a paid transaction every time. If we were to pay you um, to do this campaign, would you be happy to share the following follower numbers with us afterwards? And it doesn't have to be like a I guess um a big thing it, you could just write in the contract you know um the influencer will share the numbers after but I mean a lot of the numbers are actually like accessible you know you can see how many people have commented you can see how many people have um maybe had some feedback on it um it's just getting that like with with link taps for example if people are tapping your website link you want to know how many people have clicked on that ideally yeah absolutely and um sorry another question after coming in on your your surveys uh, mervyn i think mm -hmm. it, it jumped out to me when i was looking at your slides as well and i'm uh, very interested and dermot is asking here how you run those and and is it through yeah. social is it through email we, and what platform you use we run we run survey monkey um we have been running them since 2015 the year after we started um it has grown in size it's significant the amount of questions we asked them um, we have about 15% of our entire base uh, respond to them each year, and we send them out to the base twice by email, once out and then a reminder. Okay, very good, very good. Hopefully that's helpful. And I just see a question in the chat as well around the recording of today's session, and, and we'd be happy to share that after the fact. The link will still be live on Zoom and it'll be up on our Enterprise Ireland UK um, YouTube page. And just time for one more question, and I'll throw it to you, Amy, if you don't mind. Probably to put the shoe on the other foot, you're, you're the person here with the following 
um, from your page, what would you like to see from companies coming to you to help that process? Um, and what would you like to see in terms of that engagement? I guess um, just like the, the creative free reign for me to guess, I guess, have a bit of fun with it. I really like it when people say, you know, I will send you this and you can have a go with it for a short while or like you can have a trial of the app and you can just have three weeks playing with it because like I'd rather be honest. It's not if it doesn't work for our business um, and if they give me a trial and say, have a go with it see what you think then I've still got the opportunity to go back and say listen I love it but it's just not for us and um, we're you know 600 dairy cows in Leicestershire but as I say all grazing so um a lot of like big techie things just don't really don't really fit our business model um but when people say you know what style works for you so then I can say well I'd like to do a video or I'd like to do a short form kind of like day in the life or um, can I maybe do a takeover on your account for the day and I guess just give them a few ideas and they can give me a few ideas and like it's a two-way thing then it's it's a relationship builder it's not just them saying we want you to do a post we want you to put this in the text and we want you to feature the, this in the photo because it's a bit you know like it's just a bit salesy um yeah yeah, I think, and, and Simon from Simon Gilbert and Malone just chimed in there, agreeing with you totally around the personal aspect and that Dave dealt with Tom Pemberton and, and it was a very personal um, agreement. Uh, it was probably not looking at contracts, it's looking at getting that personal connection first. Uh, and it, that would come, it was just sent in there. And look, conscious of time, we're, we're run, after running five minutes over and the pair of you have been very good with your time. And, and thanks a million to all our attendees for jumping on and your engagement and the session hope it was useful and, and it gives good insights around what you can do in the UK market and how you can, can incorporate it into your marketing strategy. Um, thanks again, Mervyn and Amy and Conscious Mervyn. You're probably running off to do something. It's a bit, it's a busy week with Flockwatch launch and so I appreciate your time. And again, Amy, with, with calving season on farm, um, getting an hour and a half of your time is brilliant. So I'll just pop up my, my um, contact details on screen. So please follow Enterprise Ireland UK on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, and feel free to get in touch with myself if, if there's anything I can help you with at all. Um, I would be happy to do so. And yeah, once again, thanks for everyone for joining. Hope you have a great day and please enjoy the long paddies weekend. We're very jealous over here in the UK. So thanks, anyway, thanks, for thanks very much. Thanks for having us, Kevin. And if I may add, I know a good few people on the call today, but if anybody else wants to reach out and have a chat after this, we're more than happy to have them. Brilliant. And I believe a a Amy agrees the same. So feel free to get in touch and, and we can make that connection there. So have a good day, everyone. And thanks again for joining. Likewise. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much.